the reason that we come together um, today and the specific topic that we have today is the pet experience. The pet experience project was a concept that was um, uh, probably a couple years in the making but really came to fruition last year at the Urban Animal Summit where a large group of us um, in the kind of breakaway discussions we're going to have this afternoon came up with one issue that was overwhelming us and it was based on a collection of a lot of data a lot of statistics that were showing trends in the animal community trends in the community at a, as, a, at, as a whole as well as in behaviors of pet owners. And it occurred to us that there were significant issues and problems that we were not, as a group, yet fully solving. We were, we were addressing issues from different perspectives and um, perhaps through history, our history as an animal industry, and perhaps through just individual fragmented efforts we were really confusing pet owners. Pet owners, pet families, had attitudes that we probably weren't as in touch with. We're maybe more in touch today. Maybe by the end of the day we'll be even more in touch with some of the issues. And we can go out and talk to them. And really understand what pet families <coughs> and pet communities want. And maybe, just maybe, we'll flip ourselves in the way we think and start to develop a different perspective of how we deliver our messaging. So what do I bring to this? Well, <coughs> um, I'm a, a veterinarian. I, I went to the University of Manitoba, Winnipeg boy, um, and I got my agriculture degree there before moving to Saskatoon for four years of vet school. Um, and, um, and then when I graduated, I followed my, my wife out to Calgary, who was doing her master's, and I started at a clinic, uh, <coughs> and uh, it was, uh, you know, the economic state back in the early 90s when I, when I uh, graduated was, was pretty abysmal. I'm not afraid to tell you that my starting salary after eight years of university and $45,000 in debt was $34,000, my starting salary. Uh, and I'll, I'm also here to say that we are still probably, uh, the veterinarians are probably a quarter the salary cap that MDs have. I don't want to talk about dentists. But that's not their problem. That's our, that's our issue. And we worked hard to get our standard of living up. And if there are AHTs in the room or, or animal health technologists, you will understand when I say that when I first started in this industry, you could not be an AHT, live alone, and make a living. You could not afford to pay your rent and live and be an AHT because you were below the poverty line. Now I'm happy that as the 90s progressed and in, into the, the, the 20s that our techs are better paid, better paid, that the vets are better paid, but there's collateral damage. And we'll talk about collateral damage to our pet owners and costs of, of services and everything else. And I look all the time I look inside at our veterinary industry and I look at the lessons that I've learned over the years and I look forward to the future and I say there's a lot of broken things that we're doing that are broken that are old models that need to be changed in order to facilitate the new future for urban animals. Maybe we'll talk about those too. So I started at Calgary North Veterinary Hospital and I figured eh, I'll get this job, emergency work, it's night work, it's you know pretty difficult work, I'll do that for three or four months, then I'll get a real job. And so 21 years later, I'm not a very quick study, um, 21 years later I'm still here. And I'm here because of the bricks and mortar. Well, not really, it's not a very fancy hospital. I'm, I'm at this hospital because of the people. The people I work with every day. The other vets, the animal health technologists, my tech assistants, our kennel staff, our managers, and we have 19 vets and about 100 staff that work in this tiny little building, 24-7, 365, and I would never leave it. I will retire from there, and that will be probably the only place that I ever practice, but because of the people. And we built the care center. I was 
an owner of Associate Veterinary Clinics and I was actually responsible for building a care centre and making sure that the building was great and it was staffed full of specialists. And, and to be honest, it's fine. It's a nice facility, got a lot of specialists, but it's not my environment. This is my environment and we all have to understand where we come from and what we do and what makes it so special that we stay with this. And from that, you take that forward. And eventually, you'll be in a position where you're not treading water, you're not being dragged down by a drowning person, but you're actually on a life raft. And before long, there's a few boats that are coming around you, a few other life rafts, and you have a flotilla. And so, this is nautically appropriate, isn't it? I picked that one today. Um, and, and so here we are. Here we are on the West Coast, forming our flotilla. So I've had a lot of touches in my life with the different elements of our animal industry and that's what's given me a little bit of perspective and hopefully the right perspective to speak on behalf of all of you and to help everybody sort of come together. And, and so I do ultrasound, that's my area, I'm an ultrasonographer uh, amongst primary care and, and some other things. But, but really I've, I've worked with a lot of breeders over the years and done breeder programs and listened to them. Um, and I've listened to the, the arguments that breeders have about pet stores, and this is, I mean, we're talking 21 years ago, now it started. So back then, pet stores and breeders did not talk very much unless the breeder was providing the pets for the pet store, otherwise they hated them. And, and there was a lot of infighting amongst our industry. I was on the board of the Calgary Maine Society and somehow got hoodwinked into a meeting, going to a meeting, and, and which I didn't realize was really a clever plan to get me to join the board of directors for one term, um, which was uh, a pretty long term. That was 17 years ago, and um, I'm still on the board. And these people are part of the extended family that I, I love and I respect every day, and they keep me going because they do these amazing things for nothing, no money, practically. Some get paid, but it's, it's just not clearly what they're worth, as, as most of you in this industry know. I was uh, fortunate in, uh, as, as one of the owners of Associate Veterinary Clinics to be in charge of managing uh, veterinary affairs for Petland um, in Calgary, um, which there's a number of stores and I worked uh, very closely uh, with the team on the ground to make uh, standards of care, to do breeder inspections, um, care within the facilities, uh, training on, on adoptability training um, and their programs were terrific so really all I had to do is go in and say wow that's great but going into the, uh, the, the training of the staff to make sure that they're um, educating uh, the clients um, and, and ultimately I learned a lot about some of the preconceived notions that we had about organizations through all of my experiences. Some of them are right. Some of your perceptions of what veterinarians are like are right but by and large we all have only one thing that I think universally we can say we share, and that is a desire for one single outcome. And that outcome is a happy, healthy pet that lives in a happy, healthy family, that lives in a healthy community that enjoys pets and, and respects them. But there are a number of obstacles and barriers in the way of that. And when you get into dealing with those obstacles and barriers, I think it's important to look back in your life and look at your life currently and say, what is it that keeps me going? For me, it's about my, my crew at home and what they bring to our family. It's about perfect pet moments. And if you string together enough of these perfect pet moments, they really turn into perfect pet months and years and they turn into perfect family moments that eventually make for a lifetime of love of animals and pets. Perfect pet <laughs> moments. That's what a real guard dog looks like. <laughs> He's so big, see that little chair? <laughs> perfect moments, perfect pet moments. And, and honestly, you know, me and my, my family, we're, we're just pet owners. We have, um, you know, we have our share of behavioral issues that we have to deal with. I've adopted animals that were rescues. 
My one dog, Frankie, there came to me because her throat was slit in six places and she was stabbed in the back of the neck, tied to a, a tree and left for dead in a park in Calgary. And Animal Services brought her to me and it was a classic Sunday, uh, five years into practice. I already knew, had the euthanasia bottle on the way when I saw her come in the door because I knew that's the way that was going to go. So I put her up on the table and I was examining her wounds and the animal control couldn't get near her because she was trying to eat them. Um, by the time they got to me, she was pale and chalky and white as a ghost, except her coat, which was red. And um, she wasn't. I should show you her picture while you're talking, while we're talking. That's her. That's Frankie. She, Frankie, um, looked at me, and, uh, well, and I took her muzzle off. And I started looking through all the slits in her neck. And um, I then created a rule. My wife is never allowed to pick me up from work. Um, because when I looked in her eyes, she looked at me and she just went right up my face after trying to eat the animal services people. Um, and I turned around and my wife was in tears and I was in tears and she said these words that I'll never forget. Don't let the bastards get away with it. So, uh, sorry, that one always chokes me up. Um, so we, uh, we didn't. After, um, hours in surgery, uh, it, it turned around into a very positive story that um, when the news went up uh, um, to the media, it turned into a, a, a firestorm that I'm sure you've all seen in your communities um, of abuse and, and the story. And it's a feel-good story because then they learned that the vet had actually adopted the dog and that was crazy. Um, and the story went national. And, um, and to this day, I, I didn't get that. But on this tour, I've actually um, come to a realization that we missed key opportunity in publicizing that for our own benefit of the Calgary Main Society to get donor dollars and, and to make people aware, right? That's what we want to do. We want them to be aware of the issues that are out there of abuse of animals. Well, the reality was what we really missed in that opportunity was an opportunity to highlight the potential reasons why that animal ended up in that situation. The underfunded programs that exist for, for mental health in, human, in, in humans and in families, for abuse in humans and in families. The underfunding in animal programs that are available to people who need to surrender an animal because they just can't deal with it anymore, or get services that they need to fix their issues, or even know that services are available to fix their issues. These are the resources that we are entrusted to provide to our communities. But we fail, and I say we as an animal industry, have failed in the past to really solidify this, this groundwork. This is why I asked that politician earlier if, she, if we were on their radar. Because we're not on their radar. We're not on community radar. We have to scream and yell about abuse. And all the public hears from that is, wow. We live in a crappy society full of abusers. They don't hear, wow, they're actually working to fix this. And so if you're not a pet owner, you're, you know, or whether you are a pet owner, you hear these stories, and they just become a lot of blurry, bad examples of why we maybe even shouldn't have pets in our society. Sometimes. Sometimes they come over well, but I think we have to watch those moments. Those Back to something a little shinier, sorry. Um, so, you know, not only do we have, to, I mean, in my neighborhood, I have dogs that go by and poop on my lawn and people don't pick it up. I have um, uh, neighbors that complain when my, uh, used to be three, a month ago I put Frankie down at 16 and a half years old. But um, we had, uh, uh, they used to howl together. And we didn't know this, and we left the house, and you go away, and, you, and, and one day I was talking to my neighbor, and he says, oh, there's quite a little concerto coming out of your house. And then he explained to me how every day when we left, our dogs would howl for a half an hour. And uh, so, you know, we corrected that, put up some blinds and things so they didn't do that, and it's getting better now that there's only two. But, but we get, you know, we've had animal control complaints, we've had our pet lost, I've forgotten vaccinations for my pets, um, you know. We're just pet owners, and we all do those things. And, and the key is that I don't judge myself by those moments. I don't judge my clients when they come in not having seen me for two or three years. 
because my opportunity is to explain to them the benefits that go around uh, maybe being more diligent about these issues. And, and I see people in this industry that are amazing. This, this is a person who doesn't get money for what he's doing. He's sitting there enjoying this little kitten. I see moments of brilliance from people who aren't paid anything to people who are paid very little. All these moments string together to become what I think is a very positive pet experience. And I think that everybody deserves that positive pet experience in their life. If they want to be with pets, they deserve to have that positive experience. If, they, if they're in a community, they should have a positive pet experience if they don't have animals. They shouldn't be harassed. They shouldn't have issues. They, should, they deserve the right to a positive community with positive pet experiences. Positive family moments. Is that the biggest open you've ever seen? <laughs> He's right at counter height, and you can't build a counter high enough. That you can't. <laughs> Roast beef. Perfect moments strung together to create a positive pet experience. And that's why we're here today to discuss ways that we, as urban animals, the one animal missing on that list, by the way, <coughs> we're all urban animals. And if we, as urban animals, can come together to live in a community, then we may succeed in our mandate and in our mission. And then some of us will be out of work because the shelters will empty and you'll turn into educators and you'll maybe be different. But at least then we can model what we do for the world and make a difference. So what is an urban animal? Well, urban is related to the city. And so what we really are talking about here are cities, small, large, but cities. Characteristics of city life. Great definition. Well, I think animals fit into that. And I guess I, you know, we ask ourselves, you know, at what point did we move into a position where we have animal problems? Because there, there were always animals with us along this path. They've been following us around for centuries. And now we have huge animal issues in populations. Well, I think as we urbanize, the answer might be there. So let's just take a quick look back and say, where have we come from and where we're headed? And let's look at, our, is our job done? Because we're doing great things and our shelters are starting to empty here and there. And before we pat ourselves on the back, we have to look to the future and say, you know, is this just a little mini wave of, of luxury that we've been delivered so that we can breathe a little easier? Or is the future actually going to throw something back at us? And are we going to start burgeoning in our shelters again? And I, I think the answer is unclear, but we need to look forward and we need to be prepared for issues that may not be as simple as we see them today. So let's look back and we'll think about where we as man came from. And we can look back as far as we like to where civilization began. And simply put, we were nomadic back in those days. We traveled around as in, in small clusters of people, gathering, hunting, living. Subsequent to that, we moved on into an era of agriculturalism. And that agriculturalism was a pretty smart move. It allowed us to stay around ports and rivers and places where we had plentiful resources, keep those resources close to us, guard them close to us, develop them. And we did so in clans. So we moved as, as clans of uh, people into agricultural clans. And we battled other clans over the best agricultural areas, the best resources. And when we stopped that battle, we set up together beside each other and we said, okay, now you're your clan and we're our clan, but we need some rules because we can't keep fighting for 100 years. So we made rules of society to get along. Then eventually, these two clans were threatened by clans coming from somewhere else and they realized, hey, we're one clan. We're threatened by them. We've clan our clan needs to become one clan. And now our clan is about 45,000 people. Well, let's just call that a city. 
And as it happens, the survival instinct of man is quite well satisfied by urbanizing. Because the struggles of the agricultural life were harsh. And you couldn't always succeed. But in an urban center, we can protect each other. We can protect ourselves. We can use our resources more efficiently so that when we have problems, we can lean on each other. So that we can find something within that city that works. So that we collaborate together and work within our, our little nomadic, uh, then becoming uh, agricultural clans that moved into a city to say, okay, now we're all here together in our clans. We're all one. And what we do is very um, safe and efficient to move on. And in fact, if you look at urbanization across the world right now, this is 2012 by the most trusted resource in the world, Wikipedia. <laughs> um, however, it's, it's usually quite accurate. So the green represents 75 to 100 percent of the population base in those countries are urbanized. That's a huge number, 75 to 100 percent of the population base. And look where it's only 50 to 75 percent. Think about the population bases in these areas and where they're headed. And look at this brown, which represents 25 to 50 percent of the population is urbanized. And when you look at statistics and the change that's ongoing right now, and the speed at which it's ongoing, you can see that agriculturalism, well, is gone. 2007, we, we made this tipping point where we eclipsed and kept right on sailing upward here to the point where we're somewhere over here and more of the world is now urbanized. Those statistics also show that those urban areas in the population base around that map of the world are developing in an unequal pace. So the areas that are brown and yellow are developing into urban centers way faster than the greens. The greens are starting to trickle down in their acceleration. So it's, it's estimated by 2050 that 64.1% of the developing worlds, you know, the areas that we know as developing worlds, will be fully urbanized. And they're not now. They're way down over here. And that's a short time period. And then if you look at our developing world, where we might be averaging at around 80, we're going to be at about 85 to 86% of the developed world will be fully urbanized. That's a whole lot more people getting into urban centers. So the problems that we look at today, if we can call them problems, because I'm not sure we can, the problems that we look at today may not, may not be the problems that we have tomorrow. And as we cluster to get together into these clans and we expanded our communities, we thrived on mutual benefit collaboration and success in numbers. Sounds pretty familiar to me this room, doesn't it? Clusters of sectors or silos that we live in, coming together to sit in a room with a higher number of people, with a diverse skill set, influence, and energy, coming together to collaborate for greater success than what we had before while we existed in our silos, with a whole pile of added benefits that we can talk about today. This still exists, but more and more we're starting to see this. As an aside, this dude was hilarious. So I came off of this gondola in a, from a town called Orvieto in Italy, and this gentleman was sitting with his little poodle here on the bench. And they were so cute together, the way this dog was sitting at, you know, up at attention, and he, was, and he was watching things go by, and the guy was just kind of kicking back, thinking, what a great life he had. And, um, and I asked him if I could take a picture. And I didn't want him to move. It was a perfect moment. And he goes, sure. And so I was getting ready to take the picture. And he stands up. And I'm like, oh, OK. And, and then I take a picture. And he goes, no, 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 no. And, he, and he, the, the, the dog's still sitting, right? And he takes his cane. And he goes, duk, duk, duk. and the dog goes, duk, stands up. And I take a picture. And he goes, no, 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 no. A couple more taps. And all of a sudden, the dog's head goes up, and the tail goes up, and the dog poses. And he looks over at me. I missed the moment by a fraction.
but I got him saying, no, 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 you're not done. And he was tapping this dog. And this relationship that these two had was just perfect, perfect pet moment for a gentleman who, I don't know what the story is here, but we've seen these people. You can imagine what this guy's story is. His wife and him probably had this dog for, um, for four or five years. She may have died, and that's all he has left. You know those stories of how they keep us together as families, how they keep us you know, remembering and loving what we have and what we had. And uh, these cats were a colony for, um, a, a managed colony in Orvieto. And, um, and so what a gorgeous view, right? Um, so these cats, they were amazing. They kind of all looked the same. And they would run up and down this, this wall. Um, and then they'd have a little courtyard that they would play in the grass. But they, they were running up and down this wall. And they would roll on this wall and clean themselves. And there's like 10 of them all lined up on there at one time. And then I came over and we started patting them because they were quite tame. And I looked over the edge of this and I almost threw up. It was about a 250 <laughs> foot straight drop to their death. And they're rolling and their back feet are half off on the other side. And I'm like, and you're like sitting there going, Get them, put a little fence or something up there. But no, that's their life. That's what they have. <laughs> this is not California. Okay? This is Amsterdam. There are crazy people out there like us everywhere. <laughs> and so we're growing in this urbanization, and, the, and what we have is a reality to face. And when we look back and we say how fast we've grown, think about how long we've been around. 250 years we celebrated this year for veterinary medicine, a great accomplishment. But really, only the last 30 years has been organized and urbanized pet medicine that has been of a very high standard. Am I insulting you, Lynn, when I say that? <laughs> I look back. We know that Lynn's been practicing for more than 30 years, which means, what the hell were you doing before that? No. Uh, clearly, we have different levels of medicine. But we are at a state right now where we've advanced medicine, and it is moving way faster than it ever did, to very high standards and very high levels. In the humane movement, it's been around for 120 years. But yet, there's many facilities that are still hand to mouth. Intakes exceeding 10,000. Euthanasia is exceeding 25 to 30%. And yet, in other places, we have brilliant successes. Nears, nearing 15 or 0% euthanasia, somewhere in those ranges. And it's usually due to behavioral issues or um, physical ailments. I foresee a day where we solve those issues. I don't think euthanasia because of behavior is necessarily um, a dilemma. I think it's a problem. I think we can solve it. I think we just have to find the resources to put into training adoptable dogs. But some of that issue is that look at ourselves and what animals we're giving the public. We need to look at ourselves and say, we're supplying them. The people in this room supply the animals in our community. And once we give them those animals, with all the behavioral beauties that we have to deal with, and they mess up, or they get frustrated, we say, well, you need to be a responsible pet owner and take them to dog training four hours away from town. Or take them you know, at the price you can't afford because your kids need shoes. But we home that animal, and we expect them to be responsible. Because the animal wasn't properly socialized, or all the other reasons why they become behavioral issues. So I think we need to look at our issues in another way. So what we have here is an urban animal movement. This isn't just this isn't just a progression of pets in the city. It's an urban animal movement. And there are all kinds of causes going on, but there's also all kinds of dilemmas and problems that are, that are creeping up that we need to find support within our communities to manage. And these, this urban animal movement is really in its infancy. When you look at that historical um, relationship between man and animal, and you look at how quickly our issues and our and and our um, our development in the urban centers is we're really in the infancy stages. 
we think we've been grinding away at this for everywhere between four months and 47 years, 41 years. Uh, but really, this is a, a very, very infant stage urban animal movement. And what is the most important stage that we always talk about in the, infant, in, in the, in the life of a human? It's the infancy. What about a puppy in socialization? What's the most important stage? It's their infant stage. And when you build a building, and, you, and, and in that process, what is the most important stage of building? It's the foundation. Because without it, everything crumbles. Without it, problems start to develop. Cracks get in there. And those cracks can get really wide, and they can undermine all the efforts of people on every floor above them. Well, we have an opportunity here, because we are crafting the urban animal movement. We are the people in the communities, we're the leaders, we're the policy makers, we're the changers that are crafting this urban animal movement at its infancy, at a stage where we can actually make the most impactful decisions, that we can develop it with the highest possibility of success. <coughs> because we've been through the, the 60s, 70s, 80s as we've gone into the cities, 90s, 20s, and all of those issues developed and we started putting up fires and doing what we do, and we, we've done so with moderate success here in Canada. But we've had money, we've been fortunate, we're Canadians, we're not living in, in Ethiopia, we're not living in, in Mumbai, where, where there's problems with massive poverty and urban animals. But we shouldn't let our guard down, because if we don't get it right, we're still at the infancy stage. The consequences could be very bad for us. And when we cast all of these issues, we need to look at them really closely and say, is this a problem or is this a dilemma? Because by definition, a dilemma <coughs> is a problem without a solution. So when we say we have a dilemma, we shouldn't be throwing answers to try to solve the dilemma. Because we can't. It's a dilemma. It's a problem that will never be solved. And so when you think about that, and this is not a concept I've invented, this is a concept, it's actually quite well highlighted in some of our uh, urban animal leaders uh, library um, novels, one, one here called Leaders Make the Future by Bob Johansson, and he talks about this volatile and uncertain world that we live in that is um, a very difficult place to predict the future. And he, he casts this... Uh, issue very um, boldly to say be careful what you call a problem and look for a solution is because you'll be grinding away for as long as you can frustrated and and just angry that you're not coming to a solution when in fact there probably never was a solution now I'll give you a few examples of that but the reality is we need to start thinking of dilemmas in a different way we need to flip them if we can flip a dilemma and look at it through a different lens from some other angle, we can actually just change the entire environment to try to make that dilemma disappear. Not resolve, just disappear. It gets overwhelmed by other circumstances and other, other issues. We saw a great example of that today. This, um, uh, this initiative to make animal control and bylaw fit more into the recreation and community services window and framework. Because if you do that, then people who don't like being told what to do, all of a sudden don't see you as somebody who's filling the community coffers, political coffers, the city coffers, with funds for licensing, or just dudes out there trapping dogs and giving them fines, they start seeing you in the community as part of the solution. They start seeing you out there as part of their resource that they want to be a good pet owner. Well, what do pet owners want? Pet owners, you know, we can probably agree on some basic things that pet owners want in a positive pet experience. And these are very simplistic things, but pet owners want to be well informed. If they didn't, they wouldn't be on, online as, as much as they are. Pet owners want ha healthy, happy pets, but they want to be in a guilt-free relationship, in a guilt-free community. I don't want somebody looking at me cross every time I walk down the street because, uh, because they don't like the look of my dog or because they don't like pets in general. 
I don't want to go into a vet clinic and have my veterinarian tell me that my dog is fat and I'm a bad owner because of it or that I shouldn't be feeding that raw diet crap. I don't want to hear that because I've put some time and effort into the research and I'm looking at it and I think it's a good thing for my pet because what am I looking at as a pet owner? The outcome. I'm just looking at an outcome. I just want to have a great relationship in my family, with my pet, in a community that doesn't judge me and that I don't have to mortgage my house in order to have some sort of positive relationship. And are we providing that as a group, effectively, in every community, all across Canada? A community, well, a community wants to be symbiotic with the, with the urban animals, all of them, not just dogs and cats. A community needs to be clean and disease-free, conflict-free, animal services people out there going, yeah, <laughs> conflict-free. We don't want to see people fighting about animals. We don't want to see pet owners fighting with pet owners about their, about their pets. And we don't want to see people who don't own pets hating and fighting with people who, don't, who do own pets hating and calling them names and they call them names and what right do you have? And if you haven't seen the Dog Dazed video, it is an excellent representation of what we look like to them. We do pet people. And what they look like to us. And it's pretty equally represented. We'll show you the trailer later, so if you haven't seen it, it'll maybe stimulate you to see the whole 42-minute documentary, which is brilliant, right? Because it doesn't insult me at all. We're all nuts. We do crazy things. We do crazy things that other people wouldn't think about doing with their pets. Putting a helmet and a gun in its arm. <laughs> a community wants, they want a, a, enough area so that we can all exist in harmony. Off-leash areas are essential in most, in most large urban centers because it gives the community a chance to get out and exercise and it gives dogs a chance to run their, their energy off so they're not sitting in homes barking. And let's face it, we're a force. Yeah, there's a lot of us out here. There's a lot of people who own pets. And, it, and I think that it's our fault that the city aldermen don't know who, our, who we are and what our issues are because they look at us as a risk. I didn't get to that with her, but I was pretty sure she looked at us as a risk. That was a pretty risky thing she did, bringing a bill forward, a private member bill. Because if you saw Dog Days, I love that part, part where it's illustrated that a politician gets up in there and there's only two things you don't mess with in a city, dog people and, and parking. <laughs> They're way too controversial for politicians. And so what we need to do is we need to dispel that because we're a fragmented group of, of animal lovers who are attacking each other why would a politician want to support that they can't even get us to agree so we, they can't support our issues if they can't get us to agree and you know we need some resources within our community we need our community to be waste free it's pretty obvious but it, it's not real so Think about what you can do in your community to create a positive pet experience. And think about it before you start to pass judgment on people who own pets. And why do we need to have a positive pet experience? Because if we don't, we're going to start seeing more of this kind of thing, breed bans, park restrictions, park closures. Can you imagine one day if the voting population overwhelmed the animal voting population and decided, you know what, we're done with it. No more animals in the community. Politicians will go with the highest vote count. They will put through legislation. It can happen. I can see this happening in this volatile and uncertain world that we live in. Ask this guy. It's already happened to him. It's happened in all of Ontario, the city of Winnipeg. Anywhere here out in the West? You know, it's, it's simple. It just happens. We don't even think about it. Because we live in this world that's really difficult to predict. And we're not the best representatives at this point. Because if you're going to be a representative, you have to represent honestly. You have to represent completely. And you have to represent as a group. And so far, we're a little bit rusty on these. And we're working on it as a group. 
an animal, uh, an animal rights group, a humane rescue group, would not be sitting at the same table as a pet store if we couldn't do this. And we're doing it. We're in this room together. This wasn't something that happened seven years ago. The first urban animal summit, we had separate tables. There were no retailers there, except Louis, who represented PJAC. He's like feeling like the pioneer in the days of the <laughs> modern, in the days of uh, moving across the country, waiting for the arrows to hit him in the back of the head. I mean, year two, we had separate tables. We had some people from uh, growing retailers starting to enter into the group. By years three, four, five, all of a sudden they're actually talking, and not only talking, they're collaborating, and now we have, only a couple of years later, we have efforts that are really knocking down walls, that are really solving issues, that are taking a, a stab at dilemmas from all different kinds of angles. You know, we're dealing with a population of people out there that, um, that has had a great deal of study in the last decade. In 2009, Petlinks and the um, and uh, Ipsos Reid did a very large uh, study in the U.S. and in Canada, repeated in both areas, with a comprehensive survey for pet owners, not vet clients. They're different than just pet owners, but all pet owners. And they came out with some startling revelations about the behaviors of pet owners. And this data, and I'll, I won't go into too much detail, and it's a huge study, and it's got, there's thousands of questions, but from that, it's called a segmentation study. So that we're able to segment the data and the answers from people to classify them. And with, arbitrarily, of course, we created classes, but they were pretty evident in the data. The data made the classes. And then we just gave them names. And so these are just convenient names that, that Petlinks came up with because I think they're quite clever names. But they really summarize what the behaviors are in pet owning population. It was the first step in finding out what's out there. And it's been done in other studies, but not as comprehensively, not as, not as cleverly in the segmentation. And it really shows us a lot. So just in dogs alone, we knew we could classify dogs into three, one of three dog owners, dog families. In this room, I don't really care what the bug is semantics. We love pets, whether we own them or, 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 or they own us in most cases. Um, so what we found was that there are three groups. There were canine traditionalists, and these are people who don't name their dogs. The kids do. They don't talk to the dog around the house. They certainly don't dress it up. The dog sleeps probably in the back, in the back boot room, or maybe outside in the dog house. They don't vaccinate or do things uh, in with a high, as high a population as the others. They certainly don't insure very often. Um, they don't use premium pet foods, they don't buy premium products, they don't use services that we know can enrich the pet's life very often, and they have a different attitude about their pet. It's not the wrong attitude, it's their attitude, it's in their house. And they only have certain things that I feel that they're responsible for, free of pain and suffering, feed, water, shelter, love. Pretty simple, those are mine, I'm sure you all have others. But those are, those are pretty simple ones for me. If they do that, I don't judge them. That's their attitude. But I'm not going you know, to look at that and spend a huge amount of effort on those people because they are set in their ways. Those are the ones that you get their kids in the school and you start to permeate the, the educational process. But we also found that there was these um, engaged dog lovers. And those are us, mostly, I think, in this room. That, um, these are people who talk to their pets, who, who consider them part of the family. They sleep in the bedroom. Or if you're a 130-pound Doberman on the bed sometimes, there's not a bed big enough for a 130-pound Doberman two dogs. I tell you that, especially when they just curl, and they get up, and if they're not touching you, it's not good enough. You to do another curl, 130 pounds, they'll move you in your sleep. And before you know it, you're two adults jammed on the ends of a king-sized bed unable to get your duvet over yourself, and your Doberman's like, oh. happy day, happy day for Dobermans. So um, in the middle, though, we found these well-intentioned dog owners. And these are people who think like an engaged dog lover. They talk to their pets. They do a pretty good job at uh, letting them into the bedroom. But 
they actually have behaviors that sort of more mimic the traditionalists. That they have this uh, propensity to be at a bed every four years. They um, don't use services like training, grooming very often. They don't insure their pets. So they want to be engaged dog lovers, but they behave more like traditionalists. And there's a quite clear structural definition of these people. And it got me to thinking some years ago when we presented this at the summit, uh, what if we stop competing for the pet owners out there? We stop competing ravenously for all of their uh, reason, all of their revenues, and just push half of these people over here. What would that do to the economic structure of pet own, of, of our animal industry? Because I could tell you, if I could fill every hole on my schedule in every one of my clinics with an exam that I didn't have, I, I don't have to justify by having vaccinations and dewormings. I can get back to the core root of why they come in, make sure they don't have pain and suffering. Do an annual physical exam because there are things that you can't detect that I can detect and we can get on top of early, even if it's just to give pain medication. Even if it's just to recommend a groomer because this, this you know, toenails overgrown or they, they need grooming because they're in fecal matting. These are quality of life issues that a lot of pet owners overlook, as we know. And so if I could just have them in my room, and I think when we started this conversation, it was $79. It's 81 now, a few years later. $81. I can do that in five minutes. But I give them 30 in my exam room. So after five minutes of my physical exam, and I verify that the animal is healthy or that there are issues to discuss, you've got my ear for 25 more minutes. I'm not going to change that because you pay less. And we can then talk about your risks as a pet owner and your animal's risks as a pet. And we can start to break down some of the, some of the misconceptions about why we have you at a vet clinic. Now imagine if you could do that in your industry. Just get a moment. What if I, as a veterinarian, in that 25 minutes said, you know, you really need to make sure your pet's licensed because there's way more benefits to this than just money in the city. If we don't license pets, we can't track pets. If we don't track pets and we can't control issues, we don't get the attention of aldermen, we don't get funding, we cannot support the services that you as a pet owner really want and need in your community. How long did that take me to say? You know, what if I just said, you know, you really should consider pet identification or pet insurance? Because they really help you find your pet when they're lost. And they really help you to deal with issues when they become unexpectedly ill or damaged. Wow, that was like less than five minutes. I've already supported two other pieces of the industry. In a key, I think a key message that they would want me to say. What if we all spoke about our key messages in a very short to a client? And give them a broader perspective of how united we are about one thing, an outcome, a happy pet family. It's just one outcome. It's pretty broad reaching. But I think that what you're going to see is the impact economically on our industry will make programs more available. We'll make funding more available. We'll make veterinary economics better so that we can start to get out of this long-standing um, model that we've been taught that 80% of our revenue comes from 20% of our clients. So focus on those 20%. They're really important. Well, what about the 80? I never thought of that one. This was a huge message in the 90s. 80-20, 80-20. So focus on them. Stay open seven days a week. Stay open until 10 at night. Develop specialty services. Push referral services into the community. Don't keep them isolated in universities. We've done all this stuff. We're really taking care of that 20% very well. I think we forgot about the 80. And the 80%, they lie over here. Because we've forgotten about them. Because we have not dragged them along with our concepts and issues to allow them to become a happy part of the pet community. And so now we have 51% of the population are relatively thereabouts, are pro a little bit proactive. So that's probably half of those, those well intentions. They're a little proactive. And we know that reactive pet care costs every one of us in our industries. 
every one of us is affected by reactive pet care. And, and I guess if we could just push a few more over here from reactive to proactive, and look at the cats, they, they don't fare well at all, do they? These poor cats, their cat owners are very reactive. That's because cats are really low maintenance, right? You don't have to do much with a cat until they get sick, and then now you just don't even know what, what to do because you didn't plan that. So there are barriers to this pet experience that we're starting to uncover. We're going to look at that as we go. And I talked a bit about this, this recasting the role. And so interestingly, I made, made up this presentation before knowing who we were getting to join us along the route uh, across the country. And almost every single one of these examples I'll give you were presented in these, in these forums. So people are doing this stuff. We just have to start broadcasting it across our industry. What the things you guys are doing in the innovation this morning blew me away. It's great stuff. And it may not work everywhere, but you know what? Plant it somewhere in an urban animal framework that we can all trust that it's been vetted and it's working and adopt it where you think it's necessary because we don't have time to reinvent the wheel and come up with these programs take a lot of time, as you know. We can't be doing that. The sourcing is one of those issues. This is a dilemma. We need to look at this from a different aspect. This is not a problem that we just go out and solve. It's a huge dilemma. We have to look at sourcing in a way different way. When did raw diet become the worst thing in the world? When did corn become the worst thing in the world? Why do retailers and veterinarians argue and fight two clients, bad-mouthing each other, about nutrition as a, because it's a marketing tool because it's something we believe in really strongly. But we're polarizing clients. They don't know what to, what, what's right and what's wrong, and they're looking on the internet and not getting all the greatest answers there. They are confused, and it makes them reactive. If they don't see support within the industry, they're not going to keep coming to look for it. And so they're confused. You know what? I don't really care if they're feeding raw diet or if they're feeding corn. Sounds weird coming from a vet, because we're all supposed to hate raw diet, right? It's not true. I need to tell my clients that there are risks of them eating raw diet. That, that can be out there. Some of them, some raw diets are better than others. Some concepts are better put together than others. I, I need to tell my clients that commercial foods are not all the same. It's not a war about the food, it's a war about the outcome. Happy, healthy dog. If it's not working for that dog, change. Find something new. If that cat's got allergies, change. Find something new. That might be raw diet. I don't know. I don't really care as long as we get a good outcome. I'm not going to fight over the, over the mecha mechanisms we get people to that good outcome. I don't care whether you use operant conditioning or discipline-based behavior. I'll give you my opinion about the two. I'll tell you which one I think is more effective, which one is better for your psyche and your, and, and your animal's learning patterns, that's my opinion. I don't care. Make a good dog. <laughs> Make a good dog because a happy family has a good dog. A good dog is in a happy family. And that's really what it comes down to. And you got somebody who's like calling the animal control about, about, um, about your dog barking, and you, you're going to just flip them off? That's not a solution. We need solutions in the, in the environment. Because what happens if that's an alderman who's voting on a bill tomorrow? And you've made a dog hater out of him in your community. And all of a sudden, he's voting the wrong way. So we need, to, we need to think about that. We need to think about judgment statements when we say, if you can't afford a pet, you shouldn't have one. Because what happens when all of a sudden the middle class can't afford a pet? Well, they shouldn't have them. Only the rich should have pets. And what are we saying in our society if a family can't have a pet? What are we saying to the kids of that family? Well, you, you, know, you don't have enough money to learn about the love of a pet in your family. How are we going to build that knowledge base and push those people in low socioeconomic settings to responsible pet care by telling them a, something that starts with responsible? You need to be responsible. You need to be responsible. 
People don't like to be told what to do. Least of all, to be judged as either responsible or irresponsible. It's pretty black and white to me. I know which side I'd like to be on, but I'm not. I'm on the irresponsible side, unfortunately, because I have lost my dog. I have forgot to vaccinate. I do let my dogs bark sometimes. I can't control it every time. So, you know, I don't want to be judged. Nobody wants to be judged. And it doesn't help us to do so. We need, sure, there's a section of the population that really are in a situation where they probably shouldn't have a pet because it's not really benefiting that family as much as it could. But we're talking about a big subsection of the population now that really needs to have pets in their life. So we're in our silos, and we have heroes of this battle. And it starts with the really likely heroes. And those heroes are in this room. We know this. We're, we're on the battleground every day for this urban animal movement. Do you know, at one point, the environment wasn't a movement. It was like one dude on CBC who lives in, in uh, the islands who would talk every <laughs> week, and we'd all listen to him. And all of a sudden, it's a movement. When was the first, what was the first medium that you heard about environmental movement? Do you remember? Was it TV? Was it radio? Was it the internet? I don't remember. Was it a newspaper? Time magazine? I don't know. I can't remember. Because it's been everywhere, permeating our being and our society for so many years that we've forgotten where it started and where the movement came from. It's a movement. Like Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. Started somewhere, but now it's a concept. It's a movement. And the, the, the heroes are you. And they're also your pet lovers. We need those pet lovers engaged in our battle. They need to be along with us in this fight. Because they're the people who are going to stand up and say, you're right. They're, they're politicians. They're, they're all sorts of people out in your community that can help us. And we don't engage them enough. Because we fight our little battles within our little silos with all the little minions that we are. And we fight hard for our battles, but we don't look outside and say, hey, you're a pet owner, come join us. Help us with this, because we have issues. But there are some unlikely heroes. In this battle, we've forgotten about these. This year, we no longer forget about these. These are the unlikely heroes that we need in this battle to complete the community element that we've been missing. And one on one in this, but now, I can't even argue how much sense this makes, because it's just, self-evident. If we have rent property, uh, no, no pet rent issues, who do we have to blame? The renters? No. They have a dilemma. Their property gets destroyed, they lose money, they, they're in there to rent property. We need to help them solve that. They need to be on our side to come up with solutions. Or at least to recast the dilemma and look at it from a different lens. We need social agencies involved that are in houses that are abusing animals and people at the same time, or that have problems with finances and no apparent source of resources because those are the people who don't seek out resources for their pet problems. We need to look at city planners and developers to make communities that we can be proud of. And so we look at this urban animal model and we say the ideal would be right in here, this ideal care, right in the center of the onion. But if we take too big a bite and we get right down in here, we're just going to end up in tears. Onion analogy. Sorry. It's a little weak. I didn't realize that. But somewhere out here, we have to start with the minimum standards of care that we can all put up with, that we can all agree on. And that is not a responsible pet care message anymore. That should be the result of promoting a positive pet experience. Because if we just tell them what to do, like we've been doing for the last 20, 30 years, it's just not getting through them. It's not working. They're confused. They don't know who to believe and what to trust. But if we go at it and say, you know, you have a positive relationship with your pet because your pet is good for you and your community because, and help them to understand their positive pet experience, and we can start pushing ourselves further and further inside, past minimum standard to basic care so that the majority of our pet owners can be giving basic care to their pets. So that maybe more of them will be giving high quality care and I guess eventually we can hope that we have ideal care in our community. And so we cluster together 
and we fight for that. And I think that our strength in numbers across the country and around the world will be the answer to this. And this community infrastructure is a new one on this. This is a little bit well known to us. This is how we've been dividing up the urban animal community for about six or seven years as we've grown. <coughs> But the new one is community infrastructure. These are the people in our community that can help us. They don't have to be pet owners. And so I leave you with these questions. How do we deal with this as a group to create a positive pet experience for the people in our region, for the families in our region, and for the communities in our region? How do we do it with a sustainable element and a message from all of us that doesn't lecture or create judgment? so that they'll listen to us and we'll start to see more positive results. Thanks.